live so uh welcome everyone to buckets and books episode two of the fall of reach by eric nyland um i'm turbo charizard and i'll be reading to you ch uh, chapters two and three so uh thank you pernicious duke for leading us in there we are chapter two 11.30 hours, August 17th, 2517, military calendar. Eridanus system, Eridanus II, Elysium City. The orange sun cast a fiery glow on the playground of Elysium City Primary Education Facility Number 119. Dr. Halsey and Lieutenant Keyes stood in the semi-shade of a can canvas awning and watched children as they screamed and chased one another and climbed on steel, uh, steel lattices and skimmed grab balls across the repulsor courts. Lieutenant Keyes looked extremely uncomfortable in civilian clothes. He wore a loose gray suit, a white shirt, and no tie. Dr. Halsey found his sudden awkwardness charming. When he had complained the clothes were too loose and sloppy, she almost laughed. He was pure military to the core, even out of uniform. The lieutenant stood rigid, as if he were in, at perpetual attention. It's nice here, she said. The colony doesn't know how good they've got it. Rural lifestyle, no pollution, no crowd calming. Climate controlled weather. The lieutenant grunted an acknowledgement as he tried to smooth the wrinkles out of his silk jacket. Relax, she said. We're supposed to be parents and inspecting the school for our little girl. She slipped her arm through his, and although she would have thought such a feat impossible, the lieutenant stood even straighter. She sighed and pulled away from him, opened her purse, and retrieved a palm-sized pad. She adjusted the brim of her wide straw hat to shade the pad from the moon glare. Uh, with a tap of her finger, she assessed and scanned the file that she had assembled on their subject. Number 117 had all the genetic markers she had flagged in her original study. He was close to perfect subject for her purposes as science could determine. But Halsey knew it would take more than theoretical perfection to make this project work. People were more than the sum of their genes. There were more environmental factors, mutations, learned ethics, and a hundred other factors that could make this candidate acceptable. The picture in the file showed a typical six-year-old male. He had tussled brown hair and a sly grin that revealed a gap between his front teeth. A few freckles were scattered across his cheeks. Good, she could match the pattern to confirm his identity. Our subject, as she angled the pad toward the lieutenant so he could see the boy, Dr. Halsey noticed that the picture was four months old. Didn't Oni realize how fast these children changed? Sloppy. She made a note to request updated pictures on a regular basis until phase three started. Is that him? The lieutenant whispered. Dr. Halsey looked up. The lieutenant nodded to a grassy hill at the end of the playground. The crest of that hill was bare dirt, scuffed clean of all vegetation. A dozen boys pushed and shoved one another, grabbed, tackled, and rolled down the slope then got up, ran back, and started the process over. King of the hill, Dr. Halsey remarked. One boy stood on the crest. He blocked, pushed, and strong-armed all the other children. Dr. Halsey pulled her data pad, pointed her data pad at him and recorded the incident for later study. She zoomed in on the subject to get a better look. The boy smiled and showed the same small gap between his front teeth. A split-second freeze frame, and she matched the freckles to the picture on the file. That's our boy. He was taller than the other children by a full head, and if his performance in the game was of any indication, stronger as well. Another boy grabbed him from behind in a headlock. Number 117 peeled the boy off, and with a laugh tossed him down the hillside like a toy. Dr. Halsey had expected a specimen of perfect physical proportions and stunning intellect. True, the subject was strong and fast, but we, he was also dirty and rude. Then again, unrealistic and subjective perceptions had to be confronted in these field studies. What did she really expect? He was a six-year-old boy, full of life and unchecked emotion and as predictable as the wind. Uh, three boys ganged up on him. Two grabbed his legs and one threw his arms around his chest. They all tumbled down the hill. Number 117 kicked and punched and bit his attackers until they let go and ran away to a safe distance. He rose and tore back up the hill, bumping another boy and showing that he was king. He seems, the lieutenant started, um, very animated. Yes, Dr. Halsey said. 
We may be able to use this one. She glanced up and down the playground. The only adult was helping a girl get to her feet after falling down and scraping her elbow. She marched her to the wards of the nurse's office. Stay here and watch me, Lieutenant, she said, and passed him the data pad. I'm going to have a closer look. The lieutenant started to say something, but Dr. Halsey walked away and half jogged across the painted painted lines of hopscotch squares on the playground. A breeze caught her sundress, and she had to clutch the hem with one hand, grabbing the brim of her straw hat with the other. She slowed to a trot and halted four meters from the base of the hill. The children stopped and turned. You're in trouble, one boy said, as he, and pushed number 117. He shoved the boy back and looked Dr. Halsey squarely in the eyes. The other children looked away. Some wore embarrassed smirks, and a few slowly backed off. Her subject, however, stood there defiantly. He was either confident that he wasn't going, she wasn't going to punish him, or he simply wasn't afraid. She saw that he had a bruise on his cheek, the knees of his pants were torn, and his lip was cracked. Dr. Halsey took three steps closer. Several of the children took three involuntary steps backward. Can I speak with you, please? She asked, and continued to stare at her subject. He finally broke eye contact, shrugged, and then lumbered down the hill. The other children giggled and made tisking sounds. One tossed a pebble at him. Number 117 ignored them. Dr. Halsey led him to the edge of the nearby sand pit and stopped. What's your name? She asked. I'm John, he said. The boy held out his hand. Dr. Halsey didn't expect physical contact. The subject's father must have taught him the ritual, or the boy was highly initiative. She shook his hand and was surprised by the strength in his minuscule grip. It's very nice to meet you, she knelt, so she was at his level. I wanted to ask you what you were doing. Winning, he said. Dr. Halsey smiled. He was unafraid of her, and she doubted that he'd ever have any trouble pushing her off the hill either. You like games, she said. So do I. He sighed. Yeah, but they made me play chess last week. That got boring. It's too easy to win. He took a quick breath. Or can we play grab ball? They don't let me play grab ball anymore, but maybe if you tell them it's okay. I have a different game I want you to try, she told him. Look. She reached into her purse and brought out a metal disc. She returned it over and it gleamed in the sun. People used coins like this for currency a long time ago, when Earth was the only place we, the only planet we lived on. His eyes fixed on the object. He reached for it. Dr. Halsey moved it away, continuing to flip it between her thumb and index finger. Each side is different, you see. On one that has the face of a man with a long hair, the other side has a bird called an eagle, and it's holding arrows, John said. Yes, good. His eyesight must be exceptional to see such details so far away. We'll use this coin in our game. If you win, you can keep it. John tore his gaze from the coin and looked at her again, squinted, then said, Okay, I always win, though. That's why they don't let me play grab ball anymore. I'm sure you do. What's the game? It's very simple. I toss the coin like this. She flicked her wrist, snapped her thumb, and the coin arced, spinning into the air, and landed in the sand. Next time, though, before it lands, I want you to tell me if it will fall with the face of the man showing, or with the eagle holding the arrows. I got it, John Twent tensed, bent his knees, and then his eyes seemed to point their focus on her and the coin. Dr. Halsey picked up the quarter. Ready? John gave a slight nod. She tossed it, making sure there was plenty of spin. John's eyes watched it in the strange distant gaze. He tracked it up as it went up and then down towards the ground. His hand snapped out, snatched the quarter out of the air. He held up his closed hand. Eagle, he shouted. She tentatively held for his hand and peeled open the tiny fist. The quarter lay in his palm, the eagle shining in the orange sun. Was it possible he saw which side was up when he grabbed it? Or more improbably, could he have picked which side he wanted? She hoped the lieutenant had recorded that. She should have told him to keep the data pad trained on her. John retracted his hand. I get to keep it, right? That's what you said. Yes, you can keep it, John. She smiled at him, then stopped. She shouldn't have used his name. That was a bad sign. She couldn't afford the luxury of liking her test subjects. <laughs> she
She mentally stepped away from her feelings. She had to maintain the professional distance. She had to, because in a few months, number 117 might not be alive. Can we play again? Dr. Halsey stood and took a step back. That was the only one I had, I'm afraid. I have to leave now, she told him. Go back and play with your friends. Thanks. He ran back, shouting to the other boys. Look! Dr. Halsey strode to the lieutenant, the sun reflecting off the asphalt. Felt too hot, and she suddenly didn't want to be outside. She wanted to get back in the ship, where it was cool and dark. She wanted to get off this planet. She stepped under the canvas on, awning and said to the lieutenant, Tell me you recorded that. He handed her the data pad and looked puzzled. Yes, what was it all about? Dr. Halsey checked the recording and then sent a copy ahead to Toran on the Han for safekeeping. We screen these subjects for certain genetic markers, she said. Strength, agility, and even predispositions for aggression and intellect. But we couldn't remote test for everything. We don't test for luck. Luck, Lieutenant Keyes asked. You believe in luck, Doctor? Of course not, she said with a dismissive wave of her hand. But we have 150 test subjects to consider, and facilities and funding for only half that number. It's a simple mathematical elimination, Lieutenant. That child was one of the lucky ones. Either that, or he is extraordinarily fast. Either way, he's in. I don't understand, Lieutenant Keyes said, and he started fiddling with the pipe he carried in his pocket. I hope that continues, Lieutenant, Dr. Halsey replied quickly. For your sake, I hope you never understand what's going, what we're doing. She looked one last time at number 117, at John. He was having so much fun running and laughing. For a moment, she envied the boy's innocence. Hers was long dead, life or death, lucky or not. She was condemning the boy a great deal of pain and suffering, but it had to be done. Chapter 3 2300 hours, September 23rd, 2517, military calendar. Epsilon Eridani system, reach military complex, planet reach. Dr. Halsey stood on a platform in the center of the amphitheater. Concentric rings of slate gray risers surrounded her, empty for now. Overhead, spotlights focused and reflected off her white lab coat, but she was cold. She should feel safe here. Reach was one of the UNSC's largest industrial bases ringed with high-orbit gun batteries, space docks, and a fleet of heavily armed capital ships. On the planet's surface were marine and naval special warfare training centers, OCS schools, and between her underground facilities and the surface were 300 meters of hardened steel and concrete. The room where she stood now could withstand a direct hit from an 80 megaton nuke. So why did she feel so vulnerable? Dr. Halsey knew what she had to do, her duty. It was for the greater good. All humanity would be served, even if a tiny handful of them had to suffer for it. Still, when she turned inward and faced her complicity in this, she was revolted by what she saw. She wished she still had Lieutenant Keyes. He had proven himself a capable assistant during the last month, but he had begun to understand the nature of the project, at least seen the edges of the truth. Dr. Halsey had him reassigned to the Magellan with a commission to full lieutenant for his troubles. Are you ready, doctor? A disembodied woman's voice asked. Almost, Deja. Dr. Halsey sighed. Please summon Chief Pef Petty Officer N Mendez. I'd like you both present when I address them. Deja's hologram flickered on next to Dr. Halsey. The AI had been specifically created for Dr. Halsey's Spartan project. She took the appearance of a Greek goddess, barefoot, wrapped in a toga, motes of light dancing about her luminous white hair. She held a clay tablet in her left hand. Binary cuneiform markings scrolled across the tablet. Dr. Halsey couldn't help but marvel at the AI's cho chosen form. Each AI self-assigned a holographic appearance, and each was unique. One of the doors on the top of the amphitheater opened, and Chief Petty Officer Mendez strode down the stairs. He wore a black dress uniform, his chest awash with silver and gold stars, and a rainbow of campaign ribbons. His close shorn hair had a touch of gray at the temples. He was neither tall nor muscular. He looked so ordinary for a man who had seen so much combat, except for his stride. The man moved with a slow grace as if it were walking in half gravity. He paused before Dr. Halsey, waiting for their instructions. Up here, please, she told him, gesturing to the stairs on her right. Mendez mounted the steps of the platform and then stood at ease next to her. 
You have read my physiological evaluations, Deja asked Dr. Halsey. Yes, they were quite thorough, she said. Thank you. And I'm forgetting your recomm recommendations, Deja. I'm going to tell them the truth. Mendez gave a nearly inaudible grunt of approval, one of the most verbose acknowledgments Dr. Halsey had heard from him. As a hand-to-hand -hand combat and physical training DI, Mendez was the best in the Navy. As a con conversationalist, however, he left a great deal to be desired. The truth has risks, Deja con cautioned. So do lies, Dr. Halsey replied. Any story fabricated to motivate the children, claiming their parents were taken and killed by pirates or by a plague that devastated the planet, if they learned the truth later, they would turn against us. It is a legitimate concern, conceded Deja, and they then consulted her tablet. May I suggest selective neural paralysis? It produces a targeted amnesia, a memory loss that may lead into other parts of the brain? No, Dr. Halsey said. This will be dangerous enough for them, even with intact minds. Dr. Halsey clicked on her microscope, uh, on her microphone. Bring them in now. Aye, aye, a voice replied from the speakers in the ceiling. They'll adapt, Dr. Halsey told Deja, or they won't. And they will un be untrainable and unsuitable for the project. Either way, I just want to get this over with. Four sets of double doors at the top tier of the amphitheater swung open. Seventy-five children marched in, each accompanied by a handler, a naval drill instructor in a camouflage pattern fatigue. The children had circles of fatigue around their eyes. They had all been collected, rushed here through slipstream space, and only recently brought out of cryosleep. The shock of the ordeal must be hitting them hard, Halsey realized. She stifled a pang of regret. When they had been seated on the risers, Dr. Halsey cleared her throat and spoke. As per Naval Code 45812, you are hereby conscripted into the UNSC Special Project, codenamed Spartan 2. She paused. The words struck, stuck in her windpipe. How could they possibly understand this? She barely understood the justifications and ethics behind the program. They looked so confused. A few tried to stand and leave, but their handlers placed firm hands on their shoulders and pushed them back down. Six year old. This was too much for them to digest but she had to make them understand, explain it in simple terms that they could grasp. Dr. Halsey took a tentative step forward. You have been called upon to serve, she explained. You will be trained and you will become the best we can make of you. You will be the protectors of earth and all her colonies. A handful of the children sat up straighter, no longer entirely frightened, but now interested. Dr. Halsey spotted John, subject number 117, the first boy she had confirmed as a viable candidate. He wrinkled his forehead, confused, but he listened with rapt attention. This will be hard to understand, but you cannot return to your parents. The children stirred. Their handlers kept a firm grasp on their shoulders. This place will become your home, Dr. Halsey said in a soothing voice as she could muster. Your fellow trainees will be your family now. The training will be difficult. There will be a great deal of hardship on the road ahead, but I know you will all make it. Patriotic Words but they rang hollow in her ears. She had wanted to tell them the truth, but how could she? Not all of them would make it. Acceptable losses of the Na Office of Naval Intelligence represented had assured her. None of it was acceptable. Rest now, Dr. Halsey said to them. We begin tomorrow. She turned to Mendez, have the children, the trainees, escorted to their barracks, feed them and put them to bed. Yes, ma'am, Mendez said, fall out. He turned, the children rose, and the urging the handlers, John 117, stood, but he kept his gaze on Dr. Halsey and remained stoic. Many of the subjects seemed stunned. A few had trembling lips, but none of them cried. These were indeed the right children for the project. Dr. Halsey had hoped that she had half their courage when the time came. Keep them busy tomorrow, she told Mendez and Deja. Keep them from thinking about what we've just done to them. And that's the end of section one. So now we know some of the facts about the Spartan 2 program and all the terrible things that Oni and Dr. Halsey do to them. Uh, the next section, I believe, is read by Zetai Kagro and will be the start of their training. So 
tune in tomorrow and we'll see you then.